Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was younger, I did some things that I'm not very proud of. And I'm not going to tell you all of them. But I will tell you that we have a rule in our house that I can't confess anything in the pulpit that Robin hasn't already heard me confess. Which I think is probably a pretty good rule. Um, I attended a George Michael concert. Anyone? Anybody know who George Michael is? All right. First service, somebody came out of first service and said, I don't know who that Michael character is. I went to a George Michael concert, not because I wanted to, but because my new college roommate wanted to attend. It was my first semester in college, and I was trying to get to know my roommate. We never really became friends. At this, time, at this point, I didn't know we wouldn't, and so he really wanted to go to the concert. George Michael was performing at the Shoreline Amphitheater, and he didn't have any friends, and he didn't have transportation. So he said he would buy my ticket if I could find a way to get us there, and I borrowed a car, and I drove us to the concert. I was not, I am not, a fan of George Michael. Why bring this up? Because it was the Faith Tour. And that tour is named after the title um, song from the album or soundtrack back then, Faith. It was a number one bestseller on top 100, Billboard's 100 for 12 weeks. Um, And uh, since we read about faith in a reading from Hebrews today, I bring it up. The refrain of this song is, you gotta have faith. You gotta have faith. Now, George Michael might have borrowed it from our reading this morning. I don't think he did. Um, But this 11th chapter from Hebrews is often referred to as the faith chapter. Now, this is our fifth and final Sunday in this sermon series from Hebrews. And some of you may be cheering. Some of you may be disappointed. I don't need to know. The reality is we're done after today. And this book, this letter, this sermon was written to a community that had endured great hardship and ridicule as a result of their worship of Jesus. And their faith was waning, so the writer writes to them to encourage them to hold on to the hope that they've received in Jesus, even though they're being ridiculed, and even though Jesus, who promised to come back, had not yet come back. You see, they're disappointed and they're losing faith because they thought he would come back within their lifetime and he hadn't. So the author reminds them of what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And then the author provides a list of how faith has been tested and proven and properly placed in God. He makes his case by beginning 18 consecutive sentences with the term by faith. With the first, he affirms God as the creator of everything that is seen while acknowledging that which is now seen at one time was not. Everything you see now at one time you couldn't see because it didn't exist. By faith, we read, we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. So who is it better to have faith and trust in than the one who, by the power of his voice, created everything you see out of everything you can't see? Sounds like that's the right person or God to have your faith in. Then he, the a writer gets on to more tangible examples of faith that were exhibited in the lives of their ancestors. He begins, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Maybe that's a familiar story to you. It's, we read it in Genesis 4, where Abel is killed by his jealous brother Cain because God was more pleased with Abel's sacrifice than he was with Cain's sacrifice. 
And it wasn't the fact that Abel sacrificed meat and and Cain sacrificed vegetables, because that would imply that God prefers meat eaters, and we know there's no truth to that. (laughs) All you vegetarians out there, you with me? (laughs) The cheese stands alone. It was Abel's heart that God is referring to here. Abel was righteous and gave a heartfelt sacrifice to God where Cain's sacrifice was given out of obligation. So God declared Abel as righteous so that even though he died through his faith, he still speaks. You see, Abel's story continues to be told because of his faithfulness in order that others might hear it and come to faith ourselves. And it's by faith that Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death. Enoch, familiar name, everybody remember Enoch from the Old Testament? Right up there with Melchizedek. Remember Melchizedek a couple of weeks ago? We talked about him, he only shows up a couple of places in the Bible. Enoch shows up in Genesis chapter five as part of the lineage of Noah. There's a familiar name, hopefully. Noah, that, that a little more familiar? All right, so Enoch, was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah, a familiar name? Methuselah lived 969 years. Enoch was his dad, died well before he did. Enoch was 65 when Methuselah was born, and he lived to be 365 years old. Well, in Genesis 5.24, we read that Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him. God took him. So this is understood to mean that Enoch never died. God just took him. He was taken away by God because he, like Abel, had pleased God. And we read, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, although he didn't die, Enoch did cease to exist, at least in our worldly realm. But because of his faith, Much like because of Abel's faith, his story lives on. And now Noah, by faith, you get in the pattern there, by faith, Noah, who was warned and instructed by God to do so, built an ark. Now, hopefully, Noah sounds familiar. You remember the story? Did you read the book? There was a movie. Maybe you saw the movie. Uh, Maybe you listened to Bill Cosby's uh, version of Noah. No, no hands, I know at this point, we get all judgy if we liked Bill Cosby. Um, but Noah began to build the ark well before the rain started to fall. Why? By faith. Noah began to build because he trusted in God's word, God told him what to do, and he did it. And then when the rain began to fall, was Was God's faithfulness proven to Noah? No, I would suggest it wasn't when the rain began to fall. It was when Noah's family, his household was saved that God was proven or shown to be faithful. That was the promise God made to Noah was that he would save his household. And God was faithful to that promise to Noah. These stories are all told within the first half of the first book of the Old Testament. They're all told in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. They're stories told about the first people who inhabited the earth, and they're stories that are told about the ancestors of us all. Sometimes we tell stories from our family, right? What happened to so-and-so, and and these, these families get told, these stories get passed on and on and how we migrated and how so-and-so got this job and then we came to be here and we came to be here. These stories are our stories in that same way. And then our reading really slows down. We've been going through these other stories and we hit Abraham and we put on the brakes and we spend a little time reflecting on Abraham. And rightly so. He's referred to as the father of our faith. And this story isn't just another faith story. It is perhaps the faith story in the Old Testament. Abraham trusted God to deliver him things that were unseen. 
both a promised land and a multitude of descendants. Abraham was already old. He was childless, and his wife was barren. To believe this required faith. And God proved faithful to Abraham, and he did just as he promised. Abraham was living in Haran when the Lord said to him in Genesis 12, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. How is that for the assurance of something hoped for? God told him to go and promised to make his name great in order that he might be a blessing. So by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out, not knowing where he was going, only knowing that God had sent him to a place unknown, to a place unseen for a future he couldn't really imagine. Now, one of the important things to notice, I think, in, all, in Abraham's story, as well as the story of Abel, Enoch, and Noah, is that they didn't just believe what they were told, They acted on that belief. They did something. They didn't just go, okay, yeah, I believe, and sit back and wait for it to happen. They did something. When God told Abraham to go, he went. He wasn't just a father of our faith because he believed. He is a father of our faith because he went as God had told him. But the going wasn't always easy. He stumbled along the way. He had doubts. He made mistakes. Right? He took things into his own hands at times. But he remained faithful. And he trusted in God's promises even when their fulfillment appeared unlikely. Abraham and his wife Sarah remained childless for nearly 25 years after they left Haran. 25 years. And he was old at the time. He was like 74, 75 when he got the promise. But we know that God fulfilled God's promises to Abraham. When he was 99, his wife Sarah had a son, Isaac, through whom the great nation of Israel was born. And countless, countless are the descendants of Abraham today. And they did finally come to live in that land, the land that the Lord had promised them. But when they got there, Canaan was still occupied by the Canaanites. So it wasn't until after Abraham's death And the Canaanites were driven out from the land that Abraham's descendants finally could move out of their tents. Then they were able to lay a foundation for the nation of Israel, the very chosen people of God. So we know all the things that God promised to Abraham came true. They may not have come come out, or it may not have turned out the way that Abraham thought that it would. It may not have turned out the way that Abraham hoped that it would, but God fulfilled God's promises to Abraham. God promised that he would be Abraham's God and that his people would be God's people, and they were, and they are. And the same is true of us. We have faith in things that are unseen because it is in that that same faithful and trustworthy God who made his covenant with Abraham, who has promised to be our God, if only we will have faith in him, and then we will be God's people. The God who spoke the world into being, everything, not only creation, but life into the womb of a elderly woman, Sarah, that same God, has spoken, spoke a life into being in the womb of a young virgin girl, thereby demonstrating the power of God's word to create life where life hadn't existed before, where life shouldn't exist from our worldly perspective. And it's that God who revealed God's self to us in the form of a baby so that he might be seen and we might come to know him, to trust him, and to have faith In Him. Throughout this series and in Hebrews, we've talked about the incarnation, the very dwelling of God as human among us, God with us. 
And throughout the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the visible God, we have been promised an unseen or invisible everlasting life in the kingdom where God is both the architect and the builder. It's a kingdom that we will not fully see until we have died. But the promise to us is no less true than the covenant that God made with Abraham. For you see, we have received assurance of this as yet unseen promise through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that assurance we will remember. And we celebrate as we gather at the Lord's table in a few moments. For God and God's kindness has given us this sacrament of holy communion as not only a reminder but a tangible sign that we as humans need and crave of his promise to us. You see, Jesus took the very ordinary bread and cup which were present at every Passover meal and he gave them new meaning. He said they would become a sign of the new covenant that God made and was making with us. A promise of everlasting life in his presence. This sacrament, like baptism, is a visible sign of the invisible grace and love that we receive from God. It gives us something tangible in our tactile existence to have, to hold, to receive, kind of like ice cream. Well, not really, but still tangible. In order that we might remember that God and God's love for us has made each and every one of us a promise. A promise. That if we believe in him, We have the assurance of the hope of life everlasting. If we have faith in him, we will receive the gift of a new life, just as he promised through the person of Jesus Christ. Such a promise could only be made and fulfilled by a God who has the power to create life where life should not exist. So thanks be to God for the power of his life-giving word and for the hope and assurance that we receive through the remembrance and celebration of his resurrection at this holy table. My friends, rest assured, God is not ashamed to be called our God even if we've attended a George Michael concert. (laughs) For God has prepared a city, a kingdom, in heaven and here on earth For us. You just gotta have faith. Amen.